Michael, Eric, how are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning. Well, I guess it depends on where you're at, right? Good morning, good afternoon. So we've got a really cool session coming up here, guys. These are two people that I don't like to use the word savant. Many people don't like when I use that word. And I can, I can maybe see some of that frustrated. My, Michael's going to laser beam me through the, uh, the, uh, the camera here. But these two guys are amazing. They, they've given some really amazing trainings that I've sat in. And so it was really special for us to be able to, to get both of these guys together on the same call. We don't know how it's going to go because they're so very different in what they do. Um, this session, however, is being sponsored by Claro. Uh, so if you know Claro, fantastic. If you don't know Claro, um, basically it's a people analytics tool that essentially is going to help you make better hires faster. Uh, we do have a poll that I want to, that I want to kick off with here. So Ashley, if you could launch that poll real quick, and this is going to help kind of set the tone for the presentation today. So please take a moment, answer this. We're going to let it run for a few minutes. Um, and as you guys are doing that, I'm gonna run through some of the housekeeping items. You don't need to see the slide here. So let's get as many people as we can to answer this because it's gonna drive some of the things that we need today. Uh, housekeeping items, if you're just joining, this is in listen-only mode, so you can hear us, we can hear you. Questions, answer them, or put your questions in the question panel that's on the right-hand side of your screen. We will gather those up throughout the entire uh, session and we will ask them. Some of them we may get during the session. The majority of them will probably wait until uh, later on in, in the session um, so that we can make sure we get a lot of this training in. And the materials, anything that is here, we will get to you. That includes the recording, the handouts, any list, anything that is uh, being shared with uh, today. So with that, that was the, the housekeeping slide there. So if you guys want to see it, there it is. We're going to go through this slide every session because we have people coming and have people going. Uh, so that's that. So with that said, guys, who am I sharing? Who am I gonna give sharing to? You're gonna share with me. All right, I'm gonna give it to Eric. So Eric, that's gonna come through in just a moment. And when it does, go ahead and share your screen. And then I'm gonna pop off. There we go, perfect. So I'm coming off, guys. I'm gonna leave this to you, the experts, to do what you gotta do. Perfect. Great. All right. Why don't you go ahead, Eric, start off. Yeah, well, Michael and I decided we we're going to do something a little different in the sense that we wanted to go ahead and share some generic um, all-purpose search techniques that we thought would help any recruiter with any search, not just the technical ones that we often do, but the ones that you may have in healthcare or sales or accounting and finance or, or other areas around the world. So we thought when we got on the phone and we started preparing for this, we realized that just our dialogue back and forth was actually kind of interesting, sharing some of the things he does, sharing some of the things I do. So we built a slide deck around that. And then at the end of our slides, we'll go ahead and jump online and show some of the examples that we actually discussed in our conversation. So we're gonna jump into the, the first few slides. Mike, what, what, tell me more about this one. Yeah, I think we talked about this and I wanted to share this with the people about why job descriptions are, the, are not the best tools for searching. You know, typically they're written by HR, um, with little or no input from the hiring teams, hiring managers. They do not really describe the job, what it takes to be successful. And a lot of them just have what they think the job is. So they're very minimal and, and also very functional. I don't think you and I both have seen job description in the past where it's like, needs Java, needs this, needs this, needs this. But what do I get to do? What am I going to be doing? How am I going to be successful? How do I contribute? So, you know, that's where job descriptions are. We, you know, quite frankly, we said job descriptions are useless because they get, they give you an idea what the job title is, but it's like resumes. If you don't write what you do well and just copy the job description, you're just copying more of something that's less useful and you're not likely to match up if you're looking. So I'm kind of talking from a search perspective, but also when you're looking for work, you know, you don't want to take the job description and use that as your as your description of yourself you you know what was i great at well you're obviously great at java but why or you're obviously great at uh, being an actuary but why so that's what we try to do as corporate recruiters and agencies as well is get to the meat of what we need to look for so if you hit that next slide there yeah 
So, and then, and again, from conversations I've had, the biggest thing to ask whenever you're talking to people on search is, what are we missing? What am I missing on here? What's not on here? Um, I've had many hiring managers, I'm sure you have, Eric, where we've talked to them and they said, I've not seen the job description yet. I'm like, okay, and you're hiring for the role, you have no idea. Um, and a couple of key words I ask also, what, when we get into this, what's nice to have? What is it that you want above the basic skills? Um, as you know, there's, there's a lot of subjective things that really turn into objective goals with somebody when they come in. I need somebody who can do this, this, and this. Was that something measured? Oh yeah, but it's not listed in job descriptions. And, and oftentimes um, it's not listed in the resumes. There's a lot of subjective things that people choose to leave out of the resumes that you can only actually measure while doing a face-to-face -face interview, not as searchable criteria. Yeah, definitely. And you've got to figure out what those are. You, you know, you have to figure out what the nice to haves are. So you really have to understand when you're looking for work, what the company's about and what their impact is on the industry to kind of get some ideas. But when you're looking to a manager, you really want to know, you know, what is the key to success? And that's really what, you know, the short question, but obviously if you ask them that, then, you know, they, they'll tell you they don't know, or they're like, no, oh, he needs to do his job. Yeah. So I think we both have been there. Yeah, if I, if I used a job description for my searches, I would have not has been nearly as successful over the years. Uh, I, I use it as simply a starting point. If I can glean five to 10 words off it, great. But usually that's less than a third of the words I use in my search because it's just anemic. It's just not complete. It's not fulfilled. And quite frankly, sometimes the competitors write much better job searches. So finding how they write things and how candidates write things on their resume and pulling data from those sites they are far more useful than, a, than an anemic, poorly written resume by a, a haphazard manager or HR team who really just pulled something out of, the, out of the dustbin and really hasn't spent any time on it. Well, I've also had the other side where marketing has gone out and created the job description and got so much fluff in it, you don't know what they're looking for. You know, they're, they're so dynamic about the company and that you have no idea what you're looking for. So the key between job descriptions is they're nice to have, but they're not the tool you need to use. The tool you need to use is a telephone or a face-to-face -to, -face to get with a person that can make that, you know, give you that information, you know, whether it's a, and you and I know, getting a hiring manager is easy when you're a corporate recruiter. When you're an agency recruiter, sometimes the best you can get is the internal recruiter to talk to, but you've got to get those more subjective tools because really they are what the person is to be hired to measure against. And the best applicant tracking systems will separate an internal job description from an external job description and even have a, oftentimes a place for search criteria, which is a subset of the internal job description, because you may not search for everything in the description, although you want to use that for internal candidates. Search criteria is usually what you want to save and keep. And many recruiters never keep that. They, they, they have a repository of job descriptions, public or internal, but they oftentimes don't keep a criteria per manager, per department for search criteria that they can use again and again and again, especially when they've been successful on previous jobs. And you've got to have the, you've got to save those searches because you can't save the candidates. The candidates move on, the, the respondents move on, their skill sets move on, but your search criteria that you develop from that and glean from that, <clears throat> whether you're an agency or corporate, now, if you're an agency recruiter, it's great to have because you've got a basis to ask other questions on. You know, if your competitor's there and I've worked with your competitor, this is what's important to them. Is that important to you? So I guess the key to the questions is obviously asking open-ended ones. <clears throat> so these are kind of the three open-ended questions I use. And I think you probably have done some of these is, why is it open and what impact does it have on the business? I think all the recruiters go, why is it open? Oh, I need somebody. But what is the impact to the business? Because it's really, if it's sales, it can cost the company money. If it's operations, it can cost the company money. If it's financial, it can cost the company money. Every position is critical to, critical to organization. But if you know what the impact is, it helps you to recruit and tell the story to the person you're trying to attract. So you're asking questions that are gonna help you in not only your search, but also in your selling of the opportunity. Um, if yeah. they get vague, you know, I, and I think you've done this, is 
what are two, three things a candidate that are not in the job description that you want to make the person that'll make the person successful? Um, right. The the impact on the business can also help you find actual search criteria. For example, if they okay. tell you the incumbent who left, you can go look up that person's LinkedIn profile or get a copy of the resume from the HR team and see if you can glean things that help if that person was a good solid fit in a, in a previously strong incumbent. You can also, if they say that they're a, you know, it's a startup division or they're merging with another company, you can find companies that someone has worked with that are similar competitors to that company that was just acquired or merged. So knowing the business impact and why something opened up will give you all kinds of new ways to search for competitors and sample resumes that are out there. Yeah, definitely. And, and in pretext to getting a job description and people that know me, I've, I've done presentations on competitive intelligence. Your competitive intelligence is not only the company, but also can be the people that are there that have left and where they've come from or who the hiring person is. So, you know, your questions that you're asking are also need to be predicated on doing some competitive intelligence. If you're taking a job description, run with it, you're already three steps in the wrong direction. You know, so um, the other and that's thing- that's probably non-conventional wisdom. I would say a lot, a lot of recruiters in their first few years really see the job description as, as liquid gold, both on advertising and distributing the job and getting the word on the street, especially now with a high unemployment rate. But really, I, I recommend everybody in the search business take the job description with, with a grain of salt. Unfortunately, it's not as good as they need to be. So just go with the opposite direction and you'll be much better off in many cases. Yeah, and, and to be able you and again, you have to be the subject matter subject matter expert when you're recruiting to the hiring manager and that, you need to do some intel on these roles. You need to understand what it is. You need to come in and ask intelligent questions. You need to know what the thing you're recruiting for, what is an actuary? If you don't know, go look it up, but also look what other jobs are out there. But yeah. competitive intelligence ahead of time makes you sound so much smarter when you get in there. You know, and you know as well as I do, Eric, when it comes to like, okay, well, we need Java and JavaScript. Okay, well, if you're in technical recruiting, you know they're two different things, and they really have different functions within your organization to what you, if you're going to be using that particular skill set. Yeah. But like building and collections, but they're going to be calling people all day asking for money. Well, that's really collections. You yeah, know, that's again asking the questions to find out. But the last question I have on here, and I think we talked about this in the past, I think on a presentation, other presentation is. 30 60 90 days success you know a lot of people think oh that's just for salespeople, and it's not because really your 90 days are what you're being measured by your 90 days within a company sets your tone for your career with that organization you know and if you're successful make an impact you're a great employee you're a great hire everybody loves you but if you don't know what your targets are it's hard to do that. So these 30, 60, 90 day measuring sticks are great again for search criteria because if you know what they're gonna be measured on, again, you can take that back for search criteria. And yeah, this is, uh, I'm glad you brought this up, um, probably a little better format, but this is an intake form that I've shared with people and it covers a lot of these and a lot of the stuff you're gonna have ahead of time. But if you'll scroll down on this one, Eric, uh, if you can, you know, there's the must haves, but then again, you know, what is it you're looking for? And then the questions, I will tell you that number five here is probably your best tool to get your search criteria is, what three questions do you want me to ask and what are the acceptable answers? That I have found time and time again, if you ask them what they're gonna ask, that gives you the ideal candidate. That will give you your search criteria in a nutshell, <clears throat> you know, and these other ones are, again, how to recruit further on and career development and opportunities and where should I get these people from and number of performers, you know, again, what is it that helps people be successful? These conversations, this needs to be a conversation. Do you need to ask all 11 of these? Probably not, because you're going to be on the phone for an hour or more, but you can glean a lot of this on your own. So but asking them what they're going to ask is huge. Yeah, when, when, 
you know, this gets into the next step. And, and that's, you know, once you have the material, be it sample resumes, sample candidates, um, things you've pulled from other job descriptions, your current job description and previous searches that have had success, you then need to come up with a, a way to pick which terms you're going to use. Now, Ronnie, in some of the, uh, in the previous sessions, showed that, you know, you can do it with this, a cloud and you can upload a bunch of sample resumes and kind of see what words they use. But the fact is, every recruiter is a little bit different. This has been my approach for years, is I like to take at least five titles that are generally used in the industry that are common titles. There may be 55 titles when you look at all the different companies and competitors that are out there, but start with the five most common. You're probably gonna get 80 to 90% of the candidates who have either had that title previously or have that title currently in your pool. So find at least five. If you like 10, find 10, but I normally start with five. Usually if I don't have five, because it's, a familiar, it's not a job I'm familiar with, I'll start with three, look at some sample resumes, look at the previous titles those people had and find the remaining two. So here's an example of five or six titles from talent acquisition. And then I'm gonna look at the rec and say, what are the must have words? There may be a lot of must haves under that section in the resume and the job description, but you really wanna down grade it to just one or two items, no more than three to start with, because exactly. you can then build a search that has all your nice to have terms at the end. So you can weight the search in such a way that it has all the required skills, but then has and will highlight all the desired skills if you build it properly. Michael, do you do something similar? Yeah, I think the nice to have terms are basically the second part of a search, because again, you're going to get a lot of responses on your first short search. And putting that weighted on the back end there is huge because the nice to haves, it can be terms like you put in there, university of, um, or it can be particular uh, functional portions of the job. But yeah, the nice to have terms, I saved up for the second search. Use, like you said, three, three is about this max skill I ask. So when I'm asking those three questions, I'm asking basically, tell me three things you got to have. What are the must have? And then the job description and your conversation with the rest of the intake can build this out. So yeah, definitely, you know, when it comes to titles, I have a tendency to probably do two or three because I want it to be broad. And then I put the weight, like you said, with nice have terms to really help use that to, to drive it down. In the same way, as I start with five and I find more titles, I'll add more titles into the search. And then the quick way to then find all the additional alternate titles is simply just insert a not command in front of that bracketed search, most support ands, ors, and nots. So you can just say, find me everybody that has those titles to begin with, and then not those out and find everybody who has some other title, but then has the skills and required nice to haves after that. Have you so done the way to do it both ways, an A search and a B search, those with the titles, those without the titles to find other alternate strange titles like guru of sourcing or something. Now, have you used the similar colon term to get different job titles? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I found that when I'm looking at companies or jobs or job titles, using that similar colon is huge in getting you know, especially if I don't know what they're doing. If I'm coming into something new and they have to have, you know, they want, they have to have this new Condor software. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm pretty up on things, but what's like Condor, you know, so yeah. the similar tab, but even for companies, when, especially if I was an agency recruiter, when I did agency recruiting, that similar tab was helpful too, because I need to know who my company's competitors are. And I can tell you when I went to work, work for Earthlink, I, they didn't know who their competitors were. So literally doing that similar search opened their eyes to who really is taking their people, not doing the same job, but taking the type of people they wanted. Now, for those who know me, know that this is kind of one of my, my, my tenants that I train all new recruiters when I work with them. And it's how to take the different pieces of the search we just built, the must-haves, the nice-haves, and, and the titles, and build a, a super search, or what I call a universal search, that can then be used in most search engines, most channels, most applicant tracking systems, most resume databases. And so the format here is just an example. You can insert your must have words. The top one is simply an example of if you have two things that you must have, because the first thing and the second thing are, are, are gonna be in the search, 
when you use an and and include either the first thing or the second thing after the and in the second bracket, and then you put all the titles and all the nice to have words, what's gonna happen is it's gonna include everybody that has the first two, but then highlight all the other titles, all the other words, if they happen to have those other nice to have items. Okay, so it doesn't require the title, it doesn't require the, the, the nice to haves, it just makes it move, highlight them if they're there, and if it highlights them, then it's gonna improve the ranking order, because most of these tools, the more things that are highlighted, the higher it comes up in the ranking. Now, LinkedIn has a little bit more of a black box than that. We don't know exactly how LinkedIn, all the parameters, because they do rank things by activity and geography and your IP address and some other things. But for your applicant tracking system for Munster, Career Builder, Dice, Indeed, that actually much of the ranking is based on keyword counts and, high, and, and, and words that are highlighted. If you're highlighting 50 different words versus three words, you're going to have a lot better candidate selection that has a lot of the nice to have criteria. So the bottom is just an example of that, where I can say it must have iSIMS as an applicant tracking system or bullhorn, but then it should have any of the things in the second set, anything to the right of the and. Okay, so I can put any Ivy League school in I want. I can put things related to citizenship if I want. I can put industry words and tools like LinkedIn Recruiter. It doesn't mean that the person doesn't come up if they only have iSIMS. They will come up if they only have iSIMS and bullhorn, but if they have those two, one of those two words and any of the other words or a lot of the other words, they come up very high in the stack. Has any, Michael, have you done something similar or have you broken your must-haves into one search and then added your, your nice-haves in the second search? Yeah, I usually do a, an independent one and two. I mean, because yep. it just, I'm, I'm trying to build a list that I want to dissect. Um, and reason I do that is, as you know, resumes are only as a good person writing them. And if they don't know what the job is, it's not there. So I try to get that real short search string to get as many people as possible. Then I do the second uh, personally, because I find that that helps me filter the people that are good that may not write good resumes, you know, yep. that, but they'll have that one ISIMS because they used it once. And then later they might have bullhorn there but having that in the second search of the first group i find works better for me yeah so what michael does here is is, is where i show a second red set of words after the word and if you didn't include those and just put and any of these titles any of these words but not include the second set of red words repeated then it would be um an actual different search the way i'm doing it this way is if you get if, if must have one and must have two, iSIMS and Volhome brings up 100 candidates, and then I add those two elements into the second set of the search, the same 100 candidates will come up as if I did a two word search here. But the difference is the 100 candidates will be have a different ranking order because of all the additional criteria that I'm highlighting. And it'll actually increase your reading speed because it's a little bit faster to read those that are highlighted and up at the top first. So it changes right. your order and your reading speed usually. Right. So then once you have your universal search kind of built, then you got to make the decision, well, where do you go? Okay, and, and oftentimes the, the, the conventional wisdom has been start with internal systems first because you already paid for them. They've already candidates that, are, that know your company. But I would rethink that only because those candidates aren't, they're already captured. You already know them and some of them have been recycled. Some of them may be great candidates, but they're not going anywhere. You have their contact information and they're easy pickings. So if you're in a competitive situation, especially if you're an in-house and you don't want agencies working it, or you have a competitive situation where you're on a vendor list as an agency and you may have 50 other vendors working it, you wanna get out there and do some general searches on the general websites that are out there and get your fair candidates first, then go back to your internal candidates or, or then look them up a second time to see if those people you found new and fresh on some of the new sites have been trafficked previously in your company. No, so I'm the, I'm the opposite school. Yep. Uh, you know, again, like you said in the beginning, we're different. Um, I do internal because nothing frustrates me more than to not be able to search an internal and have an agency send me a candidate that was in my database. Yep. Because I don't like using agencies until I need to. You know, they definitely have a value and a place in a corporate recruiting. But I, the first thing I train anybody on is You've got the golden nugget. You've got a database. These people will respond to you. They know you. 
they are going to get, you may have a much higher response rate. Now, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but if I get a hiring manager wants something, you want something quick, I got a 10 minute win searching our internal database. So it's not that- If they're searchable. I, Unfortunately, we've all been in places where the internal database is not something that is robust or not something that's adequate. So, so I agree, if you have a solid internal database and you can search it really fast and look at similar requirements or look up things really quickly by zip code or geography and, and skill set, that's great. But we've all worked in situations that's not the case. Yeah, and the one I have now does not work well. So I'm, I'm in that boat of, I'm saying what I'm saying, but I know where I'm at, I can't do that. So, you know, the, I do have to go out first to the internet because there, but, you know, I do try to vet against what's in our database. But yeah, you know, the more robust you are, and I've, I've found between you and me, Jake, Eric, is that we've been in organizations that didn't know how to search their own ATS. Yeah. yeah. I walked into a very large employer in Atlanta and with 10 other recruiters there, and I'm like, do you mind if I search your database? And they were like, we can do that. You know, so it's it's some sometimes you can be a hero just searching what you have in-house, especially if you're an employer, a uh, desired employer. Now, a lot of us work for employers that are either unknown or new to the market. And that ATS isn't always gonna be robust enough, like you said, Eric, and that's where you've got to look outside. And sometimes your search criteria doesn't come up until you try to put that candidate in, you found somewhere else, and they says, this candidate's already here, would you like to look at their record because there's a similar phone number or similar email address, but the person used their middle name rather than their first name or didn't parse properly, so it, you, you, they didn't come up in your search. So right. searching externally and putting those candidates in your applicant tracking system as soon as possible can find historical candidates that have been either fallen on their sword in previous campaigns and were discarded. Sometimes you find previous employees, alumni, that left the company that are in the applicant tracking system that want to come back and boomerang. So you got to do both. It's really your preference. Do you check one or the other first? And I'm saying there are times to do both. Sometimes it's good to do external because of competition. Other times, if you're paying and you have a great applicant tracking system, do that internally, but do it very fast before you're going external. Right, 10, 15 minutes. Then you don't yep. spend time on it. Don't spend time dissecting, you know, something you already have. If it does, if it, it leads, it gleans the research, every result rather, yep. then it's great. But yeah, definitely, again, I said I do it first, but it's only, um, I would say at best, a cursory search. Yeah. This is a power search group of people who are good sourcers on the phone right now. So we know that you generally will go look at the more complex places to search. And I would encourage you, if you have paid access to sites like um, Clearance Jobs or even the paid access of Indeed or Monster or Career Builder, use those free those sites that you have access to because they have contact information. You can really double your speed. You can cross-reference them with a lot of plugins on LinkedIn now to see what their LinkedIn profile is if it's slightly older out of date on those paid sites. But at least use the paid sites as a good if your company is paying a monthly service fee and your recruiters are paying per seat, make sure they're using those and that they're an expert on every site you have access to that you pay for, because that's data that's just yours to keep. I would also recommend that, you know, that then start, if you have access to recruiter, LinkedIn recruiter or navigator, that's, once again, you're paying eight, ten thousand $10,000 a year for that, maybe less if you have a recruiter light. So make sure your recruiters are using that over the free version. Free version is great for looking up groups and looking up certain things about availability, but, but oftentimes you can find things in LinkedIn Recruiter because you have the full access. Recruiters who think that they can find people out on Google faster by Googling LinkedIn through a site command versus doing a good, solid, detailed search in LinkedIn Recruiter is just error. You can find everybody in LinkedIn Recruiter or Sales Navigator. You do not need to go out and Google it and quite frankly, I would recommend against doing Google or Bing X-ray searches of those sites if you have full boat. But if you have only the free version, then all means. The free version can be very, very helpful to do very detailed searches, and I can show you how to do amazing searches to see everybody, but it really predicates on how big your network is. If you only have a network, if you're an offshore re recruiting sourcer, and maybe you only have 100 connections, well, you're only seeing first and second level of that. So maybe your whole view from your end of your dock is only a couple thousand or a hundred thousand candidates. 
So those recruiters who have built the time of building connections in their industry that have connected to super connectors and other people who have large networks in their industry, they actually can probably see almost everything in LinkedIn. My LinkedIn connections are very vast. We have recruiters who have 5, 10, 15,000 connections. Those first level connections, if they're right to the right people, you can see most of your industry. And then if you need to then do search engine searches, then go out to search engines. The last thing I comment about is Bing is better than Google. And I know that's blasphemy, but it's only when it comes to site searching LinkedIn. And I think the reason why is because Microsoft owns both properties, Bing and LinkedIn, and they index the Bing search engine of LinkedIn more up to date, where Google may think of it as driving by occasionally and updating the profiles every two or three weeks. Bing does it almost daily or every couple days. So even the minutest, slightest change on your LinkedIn profile, Bing actually updates faster. So I highly recommend you learn how to use Bing searches when you're doing that. Yeah, so, but to talk about the tools, the paid search tools, one thing I'd recommend for you folks that are new into recruiting or in just a few years, use the paid tools because your company's invested in those tools. And if you don't use them, you can lose them. I've worked in organizations where I've asked, why don't you have these paid tools? Well, nobody would use it. And you know, some of them are really good paid tools and some could be right down to LinkedIn recruiter, but career builder is good for certain jobs indeed, but the paid versions, if you don't use them, you can lose them. And then you've got to figure out how to do them. Or in my case, I pay for a lot of uh, software myself. So I have those accesses to be more efficient, but definitely as a career path, use those, make them part of your search if your company has paid search engines, because when it comes time for the new budget, did we use them? Did we get hires from them? And if the answers are no, you won't have that tool. Yeah, yeah. The the recruiters that that I that I talk to who who have LinkedIn recruiter and then lose it because of their unemployment or they move to a company that doesn't have the same kind of budgets. Um, suddenly find themselves in situations that they didn't expect where they're going back to the free version of LinkedIn recruiter and they're trying to make it work better for them. And what they quickly realize is the long strings that they kept in their spreadsheet or on some kind of memo um, suddenly break when you try to put them in. Um, we didn't have used to do this on the free version of LinkedIn, but there are six fields, skills, titles, first name, last name, company, and school in the free version when you go to all filters. And those six fields only allow you to have six terms. So that means you have five operators, could be an and, an or, or not, but you have a total of five and only six terms. It could be a single word or two word phrase, it doesn't matter. And that's considered just a term, okay? Now, as soon as you try to put a seventh term in or a sixth operator, LinkedIn doesn't say that there's an error or try to instruct you in any instructional way, it just says there are no results, which we know is not true, but because they, limit you on the free version of the search, there is a, you know, you need to know that if you're using the free version. The good news is the sourcing community has been very resourceful and looking for ways around under and over this problem. And I didn't create this, so don't shoot the messenger. I just am aware of this capability of doing it. To get beyond the sixth level, the sixth term level, it's if you look carefully at my syntax there, notice the space after the or is removed. And each term after the or has parentheses front and back on it. So when you do that, because of the way the rules based to filter your free access, you suddenly can put eight, 10, 25 terms in the title field and get everybody with these titles. So if you're a job seeker and you don't have access to LinkedIn Recruiter and you're looking for how to network with other people in the staffing industry or in a company, and you ran into this problem because you put more than six terms in, this is the, I will, you know, the unpublished feature <laughs> that I like to say that LinkedIn has provided those who know it to be able to access. So any of the six fields, I'm just showing two examples here by, by a silly one, first name and titles. And I'll show the example when we log in in a minute. But this is a underpublished, um, Irina did this on Boolean strings. Balash have done this in seminars. I've seen Shally do this in seminars. I'm just shocked how many people don't see this and use this on the free version. I would tell every uncle, aunt, any job seeker in the job market 
Use this as a way to show them that you have command of LinkedIn free and to separate yourself from the other recruiters when you're saying no thank you to someone. I think it can be a tremendous help to one, find a job, help candidates find job, and truly help you build better searches on the free version of LinkedIn. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate you showing me this too because I've I've not used the free version a very long time. But you know, I have people that have called me while they're searching for jobs and said, "Listen, I I need some help in in creating a search that actually is effective." But I've got 12, 15 titles that this job could be. Yep. You know, so this has been a great tool. You know, just from when you showed it to me a couple of weeks ago, this has definitely helped me help a few others using this on the search tool on the free. Um, a lot of people are sitting on that now that are waiting. No judgment here, but I do know recruiters who use this type of technique to put uh, historical Asian or, 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 or black names as surnames in first name or last name to find more diversity candidates after they've done their additional search. So they just add this as another layer to see if they can filter and get high probability Hispanic Asian type candidates. Um, and once again, everybody does it different ways, but if you know, and there are many websites that will bring up and show you in the census in America of the working population who are getting W-2s, what are the most common names for different nationalities and, and, and ethnicities? I don't use it for that, but it could be used for that if diversity is your thing. The other thing I wanted to show here is in the concept of URL manipulation or URL modifications. Many recruiters for years have been able to go in and manipulate the URL by adding little things, removing little things, adjusting little things. But I wanted to make sure that for all the job seekers that are on the line, that I offered something to show LinkedIn's job search also is very manipulatable. Where, you know, if you've been to the job search section, you can go in and say, find me all the jobs within a 15 mile radius or 25 mile radius of my current zip code. In this case, I chose New York as a zip code. And when you put in the zip code, it brings up all the jobs. Now, all the jobs can then be filtered by title, by industry, all the normal filters that you can filter are all there. All I wanted to show you is in the URL, when you see things like distance equals 25, which is the default, and SB2 equals five, which is the salary parameter for a $100,000 job, and this other one here, which is the R value, which is is if you if you if you've done if you were good in math, this is the number of seconds in a 24-hour period. 60 times 60 times 24. So once you see the pattern, you can then manipulate the search, change these parameters, bookmark it, and then you can have an advantage. You can find all the jobs within a, a different radius of other people, all the jobs that pay more than other people, and all the jobs that are recently changed in the past hour, giving you in some cases a 24 hour head start if you have an agent built because you can see the newest stuff on top very, very fast. One of the things that recruiters will also do is say all filters and go sort by, and if you sort by newest, it'll, that it puts a value called sort by DD in there. I don't know what the DD stands for. Uh, if someone knows it, let me know. But generally that will do it. I tend to sometimes put that in, but if you just leave it the most relevant sort, and change it to the most recent hour or the most recent 30 minutes, it can really be a game changer. And I'll show that in a minute when we, when we go live. And I think uh, this is important too, because when you're doing these searches, especially for work, the volume of people out of work right now can flood these. And I know that I turn job searches off now after 24 or 48 hours, just because of the flood of people. Yep. And I know I may be missing some good applicants out there, but you know, it really is first come, first serve, or at least for first consideration in there. So reducing this time gives you what's fresh daily. So if you're going to get up every day and spend your hour, you know, whatever block of time you have for the day for searching, this is a great tool to say, okay, what's in the last 24 hours? What's in the last 12 hours? What's in the last six hours? And again, bookmarking this is critical because you can just take it, launch it, take it, launch it in each day and look what's out there. So when we're looking on LinkedIn for jobs, you know, adjusting this time, I would if I would also recommend that when you do your bookmarks that you do a four, five, six, seven, eight on your SB2 so that you're getting those salaries there because it, 
the job typically are going to be rounded numbers. When I offer a job, it's 80,000, it's 100,000, it's 120,000. And typically most APSs are going to have a fairly fixed number. So, you know, in addition to doing this line, make sure you change your SB2 to multiple numbers and save those multiple bookmarks. Yeah, the SB2 value highest on the pick list is actually a six, which is 120,000. But if you put a seven, eight, nine, or even, then you can get 160, 180, $200,000 jobs. So if you're a search firm and you're looking to potentially sell candidates to some to a company who's having trouble finding people, this is a great way to get a, 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 a job order on a very expensive, well-paying job above 160,000 that you might be able to find candidates on. These, you can also give these searches to candidates. If you build a search on behalf of a candidate, you can just email this link. I would use a URL shortener, but you can use this link, just email to a candidate. When they hit the link in an email, it'll build a search automatically for them. So give this away, show people. I think you'll, you'll find it very, very welcoming with, with folks. This is how I find what the competition is doing very quickly. If they're competing against me, I want to know I'll build searches as a job seeker for every one of my competitor companies so I know how they're titling their jobs, how they're um, writing up their job descriptions. One, because I have to compete to get it in the general market, but I also want to see if, if I can do things better than them. So I want to one-up them, and I can't do that if I don't know what they're doing. The last section here I just wanted to show was some of the differences between Bing and Google, and then we'll jo jump in live. Um, Google, these are those four facts are true, limited to 32 terms. You can get beyond that with a few wild cards if you know how to use them intelligently. Um, there's lots of technology out there that gives you more details on how to do the 32 term search. Operators are not included in the 32 words, okay? It doesn't support parentheses. It doesn't mind if you put them in there, it just ignores them. So if you're used to order of operations, Google does not and has not for years supported parentheses. And most recruiters are shocked when you do that. I've double checked this three times in the last two years with top people at Google. Google does not support order of operations using parentheses. That is very shocking to people. A little over a year ago, Google stopped giving you thousands of results. No matter what it says the results are, I worked for a scraping company. I worked for Zap Info for almost two years. You will only get 300 people maximum in any search you do on Google. It doesn't matter if you're searching for vacation homes or searching for how to get a new pair of headset or people. The results are only 300 deep, period. And then the last thing is, you can use the entitle search as one of the things, and many recruiters use as a site command and an entitle search to find people who have a certain title that work at a certain company on at, at, at you know in LinkedIn. And the entitle search does work. Now, when we go to the Bing side, look at the difference. I can write very long searches, 500 characters or even longer. If you do the injection into the URL rather than the Bing search box, I put 2,000 character searches in there by just injecting into the URL rather than the Bing search box. The Bing search box has a limit of 500 characters, but you can get beyond that by just modifying the URL. It does support parentheses. It will give you 1,000 searches results. You can see 1,000 people that are on the results or 1,000 results. And then you might want to look at the syntax in stream set colon title colon because this is a much better Bing specific terminology to find how the pages are titled. So if you've never used that term, that's one that is Bing specific, that's a, like gold. The in title command exists, but unfortunately it doesn't work well when you say in title and you combine it with ands and ors and other things. This one supports a lot better use. You can only use one in title in Bing. This will give you the ability to do multiple versions with ands and ors. So how does it look? Well. On LinkedIn, a Bing search, the page title on any search that Google find, that Bing finds, it's usually the person's name, followed by the person's title, followed by the person's current company, and then the word LinkedIn. So if you know that's how the page is titled, then you can use the in-stream set to say, I want all the developers, or you can use a pipe, space, pipe, space. Google will let you put a pipe in without spaces on the other side, Bing will barf if you do that. So either type out the word or, or type a space before and after the pipe. 
the pipe is right when you hit the shift key right above the enter key on your keyboard. Now you, but every time you use a title, you need to put in stream title in front of it. And that's a really strange syntax because it, it's two colons and the word title in there as part of the syntax. If it's a two word phrase, you must put a quote such as software engineer. So, and then it doesn't matter if you put the site command at the front of the search or at the back. Eric, looks like we uh, lost you, Mike. Are you still there, Michael? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm just, I'm still here. Yeah, the the this in stream set in with the title has definitely been a good um, way to break these words out and get the search going in there. And the brackets are identified as well to kind of keep things grouped together. Again, with the parentheses being there, the brackets also work as well. Um, I don't have access to his panel there but let me see if i have the other powerpoint yeah it looks like he is coming back in so yeah let's see if do you have um do you yeah. have let me just cut Give him me out a is he let coming back you, you have it and then i'll he's not in just yet but let me know if you have it and then i'll make you the uh presenter yep let me pull this up here Give me just a second, because I was trying not to be in his way on this. So, yeah. give me this one second. Live. Yep, of course. This makes and he's work. coming. He's coming back on, but let's see if we can get you up and running, and then we can swap yep. over if we need to. Yep. So I'm going to scroll down, find mine. Okay. Yeah. If you want, we just I literally have just one more slide after this. But if you want to, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Time. I just I just gave you uh, screen sharing there. Okay. Um, can you see the presentation now, or? Yeah, we we've, we've got you there. Was that you climbing that wall? Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah, about a hundred years ago. <laughs> you know, that's when I started having kids. <laughs> nice. Please get away. But what I was going to put on here, and and right after he got into this, was the other additional search operators. Bing's information is so much more fresh, so much more new than what is coming through Google. I mean, Google's already got so big that trying to redo its repository and keep it up to date, it gets further and further time out. But in utilizing some of these other titles, now in URL will not work with Bing. You just type in the UR colon there. Also, if you're wanting to get things that are beyond, uh, you wanna have multiples like you did with the parentheses, there you can also type in, especially if you're doing just a keyword search, the plus symbol and put the word right after it. That'll give you a chance to do everything after that is gonna be in there. So all the terms that may be tied to that, it'll give you a very broad search and you can again tie it back down. Um, it's one of the things I wanted to bring up to people so that they knew, um, especially if you're doing a keyword search or something on the fly, that can make it very easy uh, for you to work with. And the or and the pipe is, is also something a lot of people aren't used to using. Um, as long as you have space before and after the pipe, the or, it works in the same exact fashion as the, uh, the or symbol there. Um, again, in body, in title. Um, you, if you wanna search IP addresses, but the domain colon is one I like is because the domain will actually let you set the the parameters to x-ray that site. So if you're searching, for example, attorneys and you get a site that has all of them on there, if you don't have your zap info anymore, uh, but you want to x-ray the site, type in domain, you know, J and J's law firm is uh, is who I'm going through. So and then dot com and bring up attorney. And there you'll find that that does a huge um give you a huge result on those sites that you can x-ray that have uh, people's information on there. The in anchor is also the, is kind of like looking up subject or in body. It, this in anchor is going to be words that are um, key to that search. So I would play around with instead of saying 
um, in text or whatever, use the in anchor when you're doing the Bing search. Um, I think you'll like Bing because again, it, it drives a lot of other sources feed into Bing. So their information stays a little more fresh. They're much more open to having information put in uh, into their repository than somebody like Google who is becoming more and more restrictive, although they seem to be a, a highly uh, looked for uh, group there. So uh, that's what I have on that one. And I think he, he was gonna do some examples. I don't have mine up, so let me see here. The other thing I wanna make sure everybody knew is that the, obviously you can take this here, but the intake form that I put in there, you guys will have a copy of that. We'll be sending that over to you, Ryan, so that you can share that. Um, you share that with everybody. So let me stop this here. Okay. Yeah, and we're we're still so trying to get Eric to on. The question. I don't know. We're still trying to get Eric on, but I'm not sure where he is. But that's fine. Let's uh, we've got a ton of questions, so let's go through. Oh, looks like Eric is coming on. Let me check on uh on that. Yeah, because I think you're like coming the, in. Yeah, I think you're yeah, like the me, prepared. Yeah, yeah, because I want him to run. I want him to run through some of that if we can get him on. Um, and then um. So Mike, here's here's a question for you. How do you train recruiters with the basic knowledge on a specific domain? For example, a typical recruiter is not a Java expert or not a finance expert. How do recruiters get enough knowledge to understand what someone is doing in a specific role? The best thing is to do a basic search and look at resumes. I've become expert by looking at resumes. I did pharma, I stepped into pharma didn't know anything about it. After about 10 resumes, I was becoming very familiar with that. There's a lot of tools out there. And Ryan, if I can find it, I'll send it over to you this afternoon uh, for IT recruiting on what every job does, how it's related, and uh, what it contributes into development on there. But for anything you're new to, resumes are your best education. You know, job scripts are right. good. But do a search and the resumes for anything you're not used to doing. Okay, good. And Eric, I think we got you back. We got your screen. Can we? Let's see. There we go. We got we got your audio. It looks like you went off. Uh, yeah, off we had a power outage in my town. Sorry about that, guys. That's never happened when I presented before. <laughs> uh, no, no worries. We we got you back. So I'm going to come off camera. Well, let's give it another five minutes or so, guys, and then yep. we have a handful of questions that we'll that we'll run through as well. Perfect. And Eric, I went ahead and covered the additional search operators. So if you want to go oh, into, good, good. thank you. Thank you, you want to go into your search demonstration? Yeah, let's go into some of the live stuff that we actually play with. So in this case, you know, I wanted to show you just a little bit about, you know, what we were talking about here. Um, so if you can see my screen now, Michael, you can see that, you know, this is a pretty typical search that someone might do. I'm searching the United States in the last 24 hours for any hundred thousand dollar job. Well, you can see right here at the top, this, this number up here is manipulatable. So I can override it by just putting 3,600. And now it changes it from a one day or 24 hour search to a one hour search. Okay, and you can see the number drops down significantly. So every one of these is new in the past hour, okay? So, so that's kind of fun to be able to do. If I want to get it in the, in, the, in the correct order, so the most recent, I can then check the most recent facet. And now the top one is the most recent in the past hour. It just happened momentarily go anywhere in the United States. Okay, the $100,000 parameter, I can mess with that as well. I can just go up here to the SB value, which is four, change it to a, an eight, and now that will get me. So even though the facets will, may continue to say 24 hours, if you adjust it, the salary parameter will actually change and now say 180,000. And there's 11 jobs in the United States that for in the last hour with $180,000 job salaries. So if this gives someone an advantage, use it. I, I found it very interesting. And then you, once you have that URL, you can just drag the little lock here down into your toolbar or bookmark it. You know, you can relabel it the way you want, you know, last 60 minutes, you know. And now you have a button. Anytime you want to check and see what's new jobs, you just hit your last 60 minutes 
and it'll run that search and pull up anything 108,000 in the last hour. So that was just a quick example of that. Um, in regards to you know, doing LinkedIn searches that were long strings that we talked about, you know, you know this is an example of, of these titles where I can go in and actually manipulate my titles with a long title search and put, if you aren't using titles or and using ORs, I highly recommend you type out the word Boolean and type the ORs this way rather than picking from the pick list. Many recruiters have seen lots of results that are very interesting if you put in the word vice president or director from the pick list, or if you do it in quotes in the Boolean, you will get significantly different results. Some of it has to do with the way the algorithm is it's substituting and pulling different things in, but just play around with using Boolean up here as much as possible and putting long strings in here. Same thing when we did this search with my keywords, you know, every, almost every recruiter knows how to do this, but this is what I refer to as a redundant and, which has an and statement in that has that long or statement. <clears throat> and then all the schools if I want in there, including my job titles. So we'll support these things. But then as soon as you go to LinkedIn free, <clears throat> and then you start having trouble because you have to put in the or with the parentheses right directly after it to, be, to get the eight Ivy League schools in, because it will only let you put in six Ivy League schools. No one really counts Dartmouth Ivy League. In, but you, you, my point is, if you want more schools in here and you want to use this field, you can do it that way. Same thing if you want to put more fields. In this case, I've only put five in, so I didn't need to do it. So if you did put it in, even with five, it would support it. It'll do it. It won't error out if you use this syntax up here as well. But I just wanted to show you in titles, you could use only five operators, six parameters in any of these fields, and that includes the keyword field up here. Those are the six I'm showing you. Now, if you have this cleared and you're not in here, this will not show up. And the way you get to those other parameters, if you haven't done it, is simply this. You simply click once into the search box, pause, let it come up. Then let me clear that out here so you can get an idea. So if you're in your normal search, recruiters do this all kinds of different ways, but if you've been so used to being in LinkedIn recruiter, Click once into search, pause, click second into people. When the people search comes up, it defaults to these three facets, but then gives you all filters. Go to your all filters, scroll down to the bottom, and that's where the other five filters are. So if you haven't done this in a while, as soon as you put a word in the filter there, then that comes up as a keyword filter, and then you can edit them from here as well. But for those who haven't used LinkedIn free for a while, it's a great way to do keyword searches for titles and get past the six word limit. When it came to Bing, okay, I can use Google Chrome in, and I can go to Bing from Chrome, or I can use, if I prefer, go right into um, Chrome's competitor, Microsoft Edge, and I can run it there. The results are going to be the same. I don't care what browser you use. I usually have found that I would prefer to use Bing searches in the Edge browser, but you don't have to. You can, you can do whatever you want there. If I then bring up a search, in this case, I'm searching for the two words bachelor's of computer with someone who is a title of a developer or a title of a software engineer in Silicon Valley. Okay. And what it'll do is when you do this, Notice it'll come up with lots of searches up here. That doesn't matter. This is just like Google. But when you go to the bottom, you will actually be able to scroll and see all thousand results. What I like about the Bing results is I told you how the format is. You'll be able to see the formatting right up here. Okay. If it's a long, it'll just see dot, dot, dot. But here's one that you see the entire thing. It's researcher at Google and this. Even though you don't see Google or Microsoft on these lines, it's still pulling up in the search properly. Okay, what I like about the results in Bing is it oftentimes will tell you how many connections and where they actually are. Because when you do a search engine search, even though I'm looking for someone in Silicon Valley, I may be pulling up people not in Silicon Valley because of the way the page is laid out. I can't restrict where the word San Francisco is on the page. It could be on line three, like it is here directly under the person's name, or it could be on the right-hand margin with people who also looked at this person and that person is from California. So the location filter 
isn't as good when you're using Bing or Google, and there's no way to get around it. That's why if you can do a search on LinkedIn Recruiter or do a search even on the free version because you have a large network, you oftentimes will find better, more results. I've run the similar search on Google and ran the same search on Bing, and I normally am finding either a third or twice as many candidates on Bing. That just means the index is more up to date. But then not only do I find twice as many, but I find oftentimes I can get to all of them because my thousand parameter, I can get a thousand people at once. So if you haven't played around with Bing, I highly recommend you, and the best way to do it is using the in-stream set search to replace your in-title search for those who really love doing in-title searches in Bing. My goal is to do that. Yeah, one quick thing I want to throw out there for you guys that have paid LinkedIn Recruiter and you have the diversity searches, search the groups. Go out and join the groups, then go back to the filters and the search under the groups to help those diversity. So instead of trying to find all the names out there that you may think may fit a certain culture you're going after, join the groups, the handicapped, the minorities, whatever diversity veterans, whatever you have, join those groups. And then when you do your search, you can do one of LinkedIn's search criteria is groups as being part of that. And it'll make a huge effort in getting your diversity candidates put together. Yeah, there's a kind of a skeleton key there. If you have a full version of LinkedIn Recruiter, LinkedIn Lite only lets you look up my groups, okay? And you can look for people in your groups with LinkedIn Lite. But if That's you do go to the advanced filter and you look down, you do have the all filters capability that is available to you and i highly recommend that yeah michael you're absolutely right there's so many diverse groups out there military particular is a great one to find military and servicemen alumni that are members of large groups that are all over trying to find and and if you don't see it on your left hand side your left hand side is usually the group the, the filters you use most frequently but you should come over here and look for your all group filter and see where that is. Michael, do you see it? I don't. Notice there's a veteran one here as well. That's not what I'm speaking of. The FIS, so this is the new interface, so I might have played with the groups already. Let me look over here for groups. If you have well, a slightly- I'll different... also tell you when you're in the groups, join the groups, but participate if you want to get responses out of the groups as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Definitely take a look at your filters. The, also here, you can look at your projects and search by projects, which, which a lot of people go into the project, but don't really search within the project. By going to your all filters and go search by project, it's a really useful filter as well that a lot of people don't use enough of. Yeah. Um, Brian, all right, you have open up questions if you want. Yeah, we, we've got, so we have a ton of questions, way too many to get through right here. So we've got about three or four minutes, guys. Um, so we'll do some rapid fire, maybe three questions or so. And sure. then uh, I'll have to get with you guys afterwards and we'll figure out a way to get some answers to these because we, we do have a, we have a lot of questions on this session and here. So put the slide deck out there for everybody will have that slide deck. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, so a lot of, some of the questions were, are we gonna get all these searches and the slides and the, the URL manipulations? Yes, you will get all of that, 100%. Um, so Eric, can you explain the semicolon and the significance of a similar search? And just keep in mind, we have about three minutes before we have to get to the next session here. Michael, you you were using a similar search? Yeah, and, similar. Oh, that yeah. was you. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it was just using a similar colon and put a company name in there. Um, you see a similar, you have to spell it right. <laughs> and then put in my company or any company, Dell, yeah, and enter. And what this will do, it'll give you like, scroll down, top 10, 11 Dell competitors there. And depending on the search, it will actually go back up. Give the third one down, um, but there's it'll give you competitors either in the organizations that'll list them out. Um, you can list the sites there, or you also find competitors out because almost everybody out there has that. And in creating, put the WW in there. Yeah, I think one more, but W. Uh, okay. Yep. Sorry. Open internet, it has to be a pretty big company um, for the related search. And this is just a 
the related is a similar search. Yeah, related colon semi, you know, similar. We'll do that. And a lot of times, if it doesn't give the companies listed here, it's going to be a, a site that's going to give you, like you see with Dell, Dell's 11 top competitors, and just give you other companies to search and help you get targets. Okay. Next. Eric, I, I think this one's for you. You had a, you, you were doing all the URL manipulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's two of them here. So let me read them both, and then I think we'll wrap up there, and then okay. we'll get with both of you guys after. Maybe we'll do a Facebook Live in a group or something like that. Um, to get a lot of these answered. Sure. How did you know that the F underscore SB2 equals seven equals 160K salary? And then the uh, next one was just to cl clarify the LinkedIn URL modifications, you would plug in your search on LinkedIn and then modify the URL after the search is done. Is that correct? Yes. So I run a search and then after I run a search, so for example, here, if I'm on this search and I, and, I, and I clear these parameters, I'm just gonna clear these. I'm just gonna pull these out. So I'm gonna run a brand new search, um, clear all. The way, you, the way I figured it out was simply, I went to all filters. I select the value that was in a pick list that was there. So in this case, the pick list was 40, 60, 80. I see the, the pattern. I go to the top one, I count one, two, three, four, five, I hit apply. When I look at the URL, I notice that SB2 equals five. I just deduced and guessed, I wonder if I put a six in what would happen and just trial and hack my way up to six, seven, eight, and nine. Nothing more complex than that. I just fiddled with the wires until it came up with what I was looking for. When I did that, I noticed it now says 140. Then I change it to seven and so forth. So just True exploration, nothing more. Yeah, it's, awesome. and I've done it too, where you just put in a search, change one parameter, and look for the change in the URL. Perfect. Gentlemen, this was an amazing session, even with Eric leaving us midway for a coffee or whatever he was doing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, hey, listen, I'm going to have to book you guys for a Facebook Live or something in the group because we've got probably about 15 to 20 or so questions unanswered here. Uh, so super, super awesome session. Thank you guys so much. And I will uh, open myself up. I am on LinkedIn. Connect with me if you want to ask me a question directly, and I'm sure I'll get it to Michael if I don't know it. So feel free to deal, deal with me directly if you need questions answered. Yeah, for, for sure. Michael, thank you so much. Eric, I know you're already off camera there. So enjoy the rest of uh, your day, guys. Thank you so much.